So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Lisa Mason Ziegler, if we have not met before. <laughs> and I am just pleased as punch to be here with my good friend, Dave Dowling, and two um, up and coming flower farmers, um, Nicole Pitt of Flower Hill Farm yeah. and Daniel Shavy of Petal Pickers Flower Company. And um, I do wanna tell everybody that Daniel and Nicole were both of our students. And we're just kind of here tonight to have like really proud teacher moments, <laughs> um, just to see what helped them and how they've applied it to their businesses and just hear what's going on with them. Um, so I'd like for each person, um, I'll go first and say, um, my little urban farm, I've been farming since 1998. And my little farm is located in Southeastern Virginia. It is less than three acres. And um, I sell, I've sold in a lot of different markets um, from florists to supermarkets, to farmer's markets, to subscriptions, to private markets on farm. And um, I just love flower farming. So Dave, and there's a terrible storm breaking here. So if like we that. lose power, sorry. That happened, that happened once before the power went out. Yeah. Um, then, Lisa, you're having your open house. When's the date of that? Oh, that's right. So we have an open farm June 26th. Yep, on a Saturday morning. Um, OK, my name's Dave Dowling. Um, I had a flower farm in Maryland for 20 years, closed that in, tw in 2013, and then went to work for Edney Flower Bulbs, selling flower bulbs to cut flower growers. And then Edney was bought by Glockner. And then Glockner was sold to Ball. So now I work for Ball Seed Company or Ball Color Link, selling stuff to people. Uh, plugs, seeds, bulbs, anything you need for your cut flower growing. And I also do the online class with Lisa uh, with the Gardener's Workshop and do a bunch of uh, webinars like this that also help people all around be better, <laughs> better flower growers. So that was awesome. Daniel, your turn. Hey everyone, I'm Daniel with Petal Pickers. Our farm is located in Greenville, South Carolina. I started growing in 2017, so this is our fifth year growing cut flowers, and we started our farm from absolutely nothing, so from scratch. It was actually basically a landfill for old house parts, and so we had a lot of work to do to start growing beautiful cut flowers. Um, I have no history of growing crops. Um, no vegetables, no flowers before we started. So I was more than thrilled when I came across Lisa's online courses and that really got me started. And then um, with Dave, his online courses, um, that kind of helped us take the farm to the next level. So we grow annuals, perennials, bulbs, a little bit of everything. Awesome. Nicole. Hi, flower friends. Nicole from Flower Hill Farm. I'm farming in upstate New York, Boomville, New York. We are zone 4B. We are basically the lake effect snow capital of the world. We, we get a lot of snow in the winter and we get pretty cold, but this actually this was a mild winter. So we uh, lucked out there, but this is my third year growing. And I would say it's like big season number two. The first year I was kind of just playing around and I sold a few bouquets here and there, mostly to friends and family. So this is like big season number two. And I have a CSA and I have bouquet bars that I host here on the porch. And we have, we invite the customers to come up and build their own bouquets here uh, when I can, basically when I have more flowers than I need for the CSA, I do that. So that ramps up in the summertime, but we also do annuals, but, and the same thing as Daniel. We had, there was not one flower on this property that was put there on purpose. Everything was wild. So I, we've been building this up and I'm really taking a heavy perennial root, even though I do have a ton of annuals as well. I just want to grow all the things, Dave, all the things. <laughs> but yeah, you've, it's been you've amazing. You've got the sickness like the rest I of do. you. Do. I had somebody the other day that sent me an email and photos of her perennial section of her farm and she named it Dowling Corner. Nice. All the plants from the, from the class. So I, I thought it was kind of cute. <laughs> yeah, Nicole, I've seen that you have a slight dahlia addiction, and I <laughs> definitely, I have the same problem too. So yeah, now I love. Um, I just wish they'd grow better enough. for me. <laughs> yeah, you're a little cool. Hey, up there. Short put season. your mic down to your mouth a little bit better. There, just yeah, there you go. Maybe we, you were just sounding a little bit like you okay. were in a hole. I probably was. 
Yeah, that sounds much better, <laughs> okay. much better. So, well, we've already all figured out that we're all cut from the same cloth. You know, that's, I think what happens with so many flower farmers or gardeners, right? You learn that flower farming, you mean I can like grow flowers and make this my career, right? So I'm going to let Dave take over and ask some questions and then I'll make my own little list of those that um, I want to follow up on with you guys. Okay. I think you both already answered the first question partly of how long you've been growing flowers. So I want to ask Daniel now, why and how did you get started? So we actually own our or own a retail store in town that sells house plants. And we kind of prided ourselves that we didn't, we were not a florist. We didn't sell flowers. Um, we sold arrange, living arrangements. And then our, we, so we had designers on staff and they started telling us about um, local flower growers and how awesome that is. And we've just always taken pride in being a little different and trying to set our business apart from others. So we had heard about growing cut flowers locally and we're very interested in that. We just so happened to be looking to buy a farm just to have more land and some animals. And then we were on vacation one year and it was in January down at the beach down here. So they already had um, daffodils blooming. And so on our way out of town, we stopped by this daffodil farm and just to see all these people outside picking daffodils. It was families, it was grandmothers with their grandchildren. And we just thought, wow, and we're buying a farm. Maybe this would be a great idea. Then we got on Instagram and fell down the rabbit hole. So <laughs> the possibilities are endless. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so before you started the farm, you were basically doing, you had your retail stores. So that's where you came from. Yes. Um, home yeah. decorating store. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so Nicole, you've been doing it for about three years. So how did you get started? What what made you cross that threshold into the field of flowers? Well, Dave, I've been figuring, trying to figure out a way for about twenty years now how to stay home, okay, <laughs> and and make money. Um, but I never really um, figured it out. I my my background is television, so I have like all, all the the TV experience and. Um, but I wanted to be home and I wanted to be in the dirt all the time. And I had a huge organic garden and we canned everything and I grew flowers and I just didn't really ever see that as something that I could do as a career. Mm -hmm. And then uh, three years ago, I had the opportunity to buy back my childhood home and that's this property right here. And this is where I fell in love with flowers as a kid. I just have great memories with the wildflowers and just running through the fields and just so carefree and, and watching the hummingbird moths and all that stuff. So when we bought back this property, it's just so beautiful. Like I really felt like it, it just, it, it had a bigger purpose. And then I started to, you know, you know how what happens in the winter time you get all those catalogs in the mail and everything's looking so good and and I swear it was just a magazine and I don't even remember the company but it was just the cover of the magazine and I was like I think that's what I need to do on this hill here like this right. hill needs to be full of flowers and then I also like Daniel <laughs> started looking online and like is this actually something you can do and so um yeah it is and I started uh, very quickly found Lisa was like, well, you know what it was? It was a YouTube video of some like Wisconsin horticulture group that I was listening to. And they mentioned Lisa. So I'm like Googling and it was just so random how it was found. And I'm very grateful that I did find you guys because it definitely was the, I don't know, like kick in the pants that I needed to, to realize that it could be, you know, come to fruition. So. Right. I think real quick for me, it was back before the internet and before Google, but I yeah. saw somebody selling flowers at a farmer's market and it light bulb said, they're selling the same stuff I've grown at the end of my driveway. I can sell yeah. that stuff. <laughs> so then literally the following year, I started growing cut flowers and it went from there. Got out of hand almost, but you know that is. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, quick question about you, Daniel, how many employees do you have working besides you? Um, we have three full-time, like 30 hour a week employees. And then I have probably three more that are part-time and some of those are just one day a week. So. And Nicole? I have zero. Zero. I have, um, I have me. I have a pretty awesome mother-in-law who helps anytime she can. 
Uh, my mom and my grandfather helped me start seeds over the winter. And I have two children who are quickly <laughs> learning how to start sunflowers. I, I had them start in trays of sunflower seeds how a couple of days a week. How old uh, my that? daughter just turned 14 and my oh. son will be 11 in about a month. Okay. So well, yeah, the, they're capable. And sunflowers and full weeds too, but oh yeah, that's that with them later. <laughs> <laughs> um, Daniel, what's blooming right now on your farm? What are you, um, what are you picking today? Um, today we were picking buckets and buckets of yarrow. Um, it's like it never stops, but yeah. we're so thankful to have it every exactly. year. <laughs> um, Lysianthus, we saw our first blooms of Lysianthus this week. Yeah. So we're very, very excited about that. Um, in the field or in a tunnel? Um, we have, I'm in a tunnel right now. Yeah. So the ones in the field are a little bit further behind. Yeah which is what we wanted. That's great to help spread it out. Um, we have Scabiosa is starting to bloom now and we are growing the FAMA this okay. year. Um, yeah, that's some of it. Like your peony <laughs> season is long over, right? Yes, our peony season, um, we actually get all of our blooms before Mother's Day, wow. which is pretty amazing and it makes everyone across the country jealous. <laughs> yeah. um, but yes, yeah, so peonies are done and we don't even need to hold them that long. I mean, we keep them in our cooler, but they're sold out for Mother's Day. So very good. Mm -hmm. So Nicole, what's blooming on your farm? What were you picking this week? Well, we've had like a week of 85 plus degree weather. So I'm pretty much picking every peony that I have. <laughs> Like all, my fridge is full of peonies. My CSA members are getting those tomorrow. Um, and I actually just picked some Dutch irises. Um, and then the, the bearded irises are blooming too. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got some allium. And what else did I pick today? Just for reference, it. today's June 10th. If anybody's wondering what time of the year is, we're talking about what's yes, blooming. Yes, June 10th. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, and okay. you know something, Dave, that I thought was just really interesting. It's like, okay, Daniel's in South Carolina. I'm in Virginia. You're now in Delaware. We're in New Jersey. And Nicole's up above us all yeah. in upstate New York. So if Dave was farming where he was, it would just be really interesting to see. I mean, we're in full-fledged. I mean, yes. I'm sitting Daniel here looking at, you know, 100 bouquets full of summer flowers right. you know we're almost done with cool flowers almost wow i just am still getting mine in the ground <laughs> Your summer yeah. flowers right yeah yeah our snapdragons are finished they are oh. completely done now you don't have a mine are 10 inches plant? tall you don't have a succession planted i have well i did we did different varieties and okay. we spread the harvest out over four to four or so weeks, but I don't do a late one of snapdragons. Always fine. We get too hot and they get buggy yeah. before they finish opening. But even if you try some of the summer ones like Potomac and Opus. Sounds like I need to. Give them a try. <laughs> they take the summer heat and the long days fine. And same okay. with the office will too, but for next year. Um, what's your favorite flower, Daniel? Favorite flower is this ranunculus. So I, pro I grow the the most flowers I grow of one crop are dahlias, but my favorite is ranunculus. Okay, very good. Nicole? My favorite flower is the one blooming before me, Dave. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, yeah, but honestly, yes. And But I, I fell in love with Roseanne Brown Lysianthus last year, okay. just the antique look of it. Mm -hmm. um, I really, really love that. But also this was my first year growing ranunculus and I also really like that. So it's the right. one blooming before me. <laughs> right, whatever's blooming that weekend. Yeah. For me, it was always whatever's blooming that weekend fills the bucket. Yeah, it changes yeah. throughout the season. So, okay. Um, here's a good question for you, Daniel. Um, how did the challenge of COVID affect your business? Um, so COVID, COVID scared us to death. I guess it was around <laughs> March 15th, like everything right. um, or for everyone. And we own two retail stores and we have employees at the farm and everything just came to a halt. Um, we sell, well, prior to COVID, we were selling mainly to wedding florists, brick and mortar florists, and then supplying our own retail store. Well, all three of our avenues shut down that week. And so we had to scramble and we did. We pivoted and we figured out very quickly. Um, it had been something that we had thought about before, 
but we decided to start shipping our flowers. And so we now sell weekly bouquets and ship them across the country. And it was, it took a couple weeks um, of really <laughs> buckling down and building a website that you're able to sell product on, which took a lot, but I also had a cooler full of ranunculus <laughs> around the same time. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to sell this you right like now. Them, but not that much to keep them all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, very good. So it actually, I would say it quadrupled our business in right. a sense. And by so, the end of the year, your sales were definitely up last year. They were way up. And part of that is just because we're such a new farm, but it, it's really helped our farm to grow. It, it only hurt for a month or so when it first happened and then you adjusted and made it work. Mm -hmm. And Nicole? Well, I had the um, benefit, I guess, of still working a full-time job off the farm. So I wasn't terrified, like, how am I going to pay the bills and my employees? Because I really just had these flowers. They just would have been composted and I would have taken that loss of the, mm -hmm. you know, the cost of the seed and all that stuff. Um, but it did make me start to brainstorm okay well people are sequestered in their house and they have nowhere to go and uh, you know so I started to uh, think about things and I started to do like doorstop deliveries and stuff like that and it really um, I don't know brighten people's days I mean that's it was just a bright spot for people I think and um, that actually probably turned into a lot of those customers turned into my first CSA members too so it was just, it helped to spread the word too, that, you know, the florists are shut down. There's no flowers anywhere, but yes, we have them right here. We're growing them right here. So we were kind of like able to jump in there and kind of save the day where people needed their flowers. Yeah. Very good. Um, Daniel, how do you have more expansion, expansion plans for your farm or are you kind of where you want to be? Or are you going to keep growing forever? <laughs> I think the next door. <laughs> it's a lot for me to keep up with right now um, this year because we did just expand more onto our farm um, this year we really expanded a brand new dahlia field to grow a lot more of those and we've added new high tunnels and we're kind of making room to add a couple more high tunnels by the end of the year so that expansion has been a lot and I've I think I need to continue to build our team if before we expand any farther. So we're we're doing great with what we have, but um, there's some things that need to fall into place before we expand any. any how many how many acres are you doing about? So our farm is 13 acres, and I because we use a tractor in the lay of our land. Our land's not flat, so we have pathways and stuff but I think we're growing about three acres worth of flowers if I were to guess I've done it on a map but you know with all the pathways right but three acres is a lot um and you're talking about getting your team together that sometimes is the hardest part is finding workers that are going to invest themselves in your farm as well as you would and are invested mm -hmm. and care about things when you find them pay them well and keep them they're worth it exactly <laughs> they're worth it when you find a good Lisa's got how long has Boba been with you Lisa 12, 13 years. Yeah. You can't beat somebody who's been there. You don't have to tell them what to do. They just know what to do every day. You don't have to be babysitting them all the time. It's amazing. And you're <laughs> reminded when you hire someone new. How and, good. <laughs> I mean, it's not it's that they aren't a good employee. It's just they just don't know what to do. You right. know, I mean, it's like Bobo and I are like an old married couple, right. you know, <laughs> and we just, she just shows up right and does her job and loves it and is responsible. I mean, to find people that feel like it's as much their business as it is yours, as far as responsibility and the care of the quality of the product and problems and coming in and saying, you know, that back garden back there really needs X, Y, Z. And it's like, oh my gosh, I haven't even looked that way in the last two right. days, you know? So yeah. yeah. When and it's really hard to realize that you just have to pay a wage that can compete and keep people happy. Um, but yeah. Yeah. But they're worth every penny when you get a good one. So yeah. Nicole, do you have expansion plans or what are your plans for the future? Uh, um, probably the plans? Too much. <laughs> there are probably too many plans for me to handle, but um, I'm slowly but surely building on. We just put in um, like 14 new 70 to 95 foot rows for annuals that I've almost 
I almost have that filled. Very Those good. are new. Um, and then we also put in new, oh my gosh, I don't even know, probably a quarter acre that we tilled up and we have perennials going in there. I just got a huge order in from Spring Meadow Nursery with Very viburnum good. and ilex and hydrangeas, which are not going to go over there because the deer, but they're going to go on top of the hill where I can fence them in. But um, lilacs and I'm um, just too many things, <laughs> but it's okay. I, I, that's what I wanted to do was invest in the perennials now mm -hmm. while I can. And I think it'll pay off, you know, down the road and your course is in my pocket. Like Dave Dowling's in my pocket. <laughs> Anytime I plant a perennial, I go, what would Dave do? And I'm getting a shirt. I'm having one okay. made. What would Dave do? <laughs> <laughs> because that's what I say to myself all the time. But yeah, anytime I plant a perennial, I, I grab my phone and I listen to you telling me how to plant it. Okay, Even good. when I harvest too, like when am I supposed to harvest? Because all that information is really invaluable. And how big is your farm and how much of it is actually on flowers? Well, we have 20 acres with, uh, I have um, owner's rights to the accompanying 65 acres too, but that's kind of like land I'm not going to touch, but uh, I would <laughs> say we probably... <laughs> No, not that. So we had, uh, I would say about three acres because I have a, I have about 500 peonies um, and then the hydrangeas are going to take up about the same space as the peonies. And then, um, yeah, I'm looking at, sorry, I'm outside. So it's nice. I get to look up, look out and see everything, but we do, you know, as much as probably three acres that we have tilled up and I just got a bed maker. Oh my I cried. I cried. I'm not even kidding you. I'm standing behind the tractor, holding the cloth down. My husband starts going and I was, I didn't expect to get emotional, but it was emotional. <laughs> yes. For there is no question that no. we can still, I've had it now for seven years, eight years. It's like Bobo and I look at each other and it's like, do you remember when we used to do this by hand? Yeah. The <laughs> best investment I ever made besides yeah. employees. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's called working smart. Yes. Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> um, Daniel already said you had some tunnels. Do you have any greenhouses, any heated structures or just tunnels? We don't have any heated structures yet. And I think part of the reason I'm interested, <laughs> I feel like I need to do a little more research, um, but because we are so warm during the winter, like I, the last two years have grown excellent ranunculus and anemones in our farmer's friend high tunnels um, with no heat. So we use a lot of Agrabon on the cold nights and that gets us through, but um, there's a lot of different perennials and bulbs that we could be growing to really extend our season if we had a greenhouse. So it's something that we do look, to, I'm looking to buy one in the future. And what is your season? What months do you have flowers to sell? We have flowers pretty much from February until November, except, and that's the end of February. Right. Um, and it depends on the season. So this year we were a couple weeks late. So this year it's going to be March until the end of October. But um, we cut our season off because I'm exhausted. We have stuff to do in the fall. So like Halloween is when I'm done, whether I still have flowers blooming or not. So I've also chosen to not grow heirloom mums because those would carry us all the way to Thanksgiving. And you don't want to do that, right? Mm -hmm. That's Nicole. smart, Daniel. That talk yeah. about farming smart. Um, and, you know, I'm the girl that I'm ready to squeak the season as long as I can get flowers out of my field, you know? Mm -hmm. And then Emily shared with me, she said, oh, the end of my season will be X, Y, Z, like September 29th. I said, it's like July. How do you know that? She said, I set the date. Mm -hmm. like, it was like, you do what? <laughs> I mean, sometimes isn't it funny that you just don't, I mean, I was like, I'm going to get as much as I can, but it was so smart. So she could get her cool season stuff in the ground and her perennials planted. And, you know, so that's smart, Daniel. That's really yeah. smart. I didn't partake of that for a long time. I guess I was <laughs> stupid because I grew all year. <laughs> we do keep <laughs> going. <laughs> we sell um, holiday wreaths. So we oh, also yeah. have to fit in the fall planting and then get into holiday wreaths. Right. So pick and, and choose. You, are you using some of your flowers on the wreaths, dried flowers? 
Um, yeah, this year I'm trying to dry um, extra gumfrina and straw flour to kind of add into that. Although mainly what we um, use, we make more classic wreaths, I guess, a lot of um, holly berries, winterberry, magnolia, real lush um, holiday wreaths. Dried lime by hydrangeas are great for that too. Okay, yeah. So it fills up a wreath really fast. <laughs> well, I just built a deer fence on our property. Mm -hmm. So officially I can grow Anything. hydrangeas now mm -hmm. because I planted 40 the first year we moved in. I should be swimming in them and I've hardly ever gotten a bloom off of our limelights because the deer eat them to nothing. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So. Okay, Nicole, do you have any tunnels or greenhouses? I, I don't. I didn't think you did. I, but... I wanted, um, last year, I made the decision between a high tunnel and more peonies, and peonies won. <laughs> right. Smart girl. Smart girl. Smart girl. Good. Yep. Well, I'm on, yep. so I applied for the NRCS grant um, at, towards the end of last year, so I'm waiting to hear, and then I, right now I just feel silly buying one if I'm going to, if the grant's going to come through, one, right. so yep. I'm waiting to hear on the grant. Um, I will have one. I, I mean, in zone four, I feel it will, because right now our season's April, and then last year our first frost was September 15th. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, so it kind of would help with your frost, with your yes, early late season. Yes, for sure. Right? Um, okay. Um, now, Lisa earlier said that you took both her class and my class. How much did that affect your business? How much has grown? What you grow? Daniel? Um. <laughs> Well, like I, <laughs> yeah, like I said earlier, uh, Lisa's course really got me started and it really helped set the framework for our business and deciding who we were, we were going to sell to. Um, but then when we when I took your course, that just like expanded and took everything we were growing to the next level. So, you know, the first couple of years on the farm, you know, I ordered tulips, but I would order them in like a bag of a hundred and plant that and watch it grow. And part of that's learning. But then your class is just so detailed. Um, you take us from like how to order, when to order and kind of explain, you know, what, how many, if we're on this scale um, and then really how to grow it, when to harvest it, how to hold it. And then the varieties that are best to sell. So you really explain everything about each crop that's listed in the class. And that helped me just feel a lot more confident in ordering more. So the first couple of years we grew maybe like 1000 tulips. And then this year we grew 18,000 crazy and sold them all. <laughs> yeah. And we sold all of them. We missed a couple on, the days it was raining harvesting, but we sold 95% of them. And that was the introduction to our season this year. And then right behind that, we had anemones and ranunculus. And I'm not kidding, this year, the week ranunculus ended, our peonies started blooming. Very so good. following like your course kind of lays out when everything blooms and you just match that up together. Um, and it so far our season is just one thing after the other. Oh, I'm gonna say one one thing I wrote down um, to mention is like this year we were a lot colder um, later. So I was so behind. We had a late freeze that was after our typical frost date, and so I held off on planting my summer stuff like zinnias, cosmos, um, celosia. So after Mother's Day, there was a gap where I didn't have all these staple annuals coming in. And guess what saved me? <laughs> the perennials that we've planted yep. from after taking your course. So the early perennials. Um, yeah. <clears throat> you can there always you rely on those to come back, you know, year after year. And then you don't have to plan on all that. You just know that they're going to be there when you need them. Right. After That's they're you're planted. Where you're picking all those buckets of yarrow today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. It's my right. bouquet filler for the next couple of weeks. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> Nicole? I will echo that with perennials because they're they are life saving <laughs> for sure. Yeah. But I have to say that where I grew up, basically everyone considers the start of gardening season to be Memorial Day. 
I've never even considered putting anything else in the ground before Memorial Day. So finding Lisa and discovering cool flowers was like, wait a second, because from, from January 1st till Memorial Day, my fingers are itching to get in the dirt. You mean that I could start seeds in February and March and start yeah. planting things early? Yes. Uh, so that was really uh, eye-opening for me to realize that things will grow and in fact prefer to grow in cooler conditions. So uh, that was amazing. And um, Dave, <laughs> if I didn't have tulips and daffodils, I still wouldn't have sold a flower yet this year. Okay. Like that's just the bread and butter for me in the spring. I have already completed a CSA. And I, we just had our last frost a week and a half ago. <laughs> so that's, it's just a game changer when it comes to all the bulbs and the perennials. Mm -hmm. And I can't stop buying tulips. I don't know if you saw my, <laughs> my ball order, <laughs> but I do as much as I get the 500 lots, I still buy the 100 lots because I like to try things out. Well, <laughs> right. um, when you... It, if you do get your tunnel, you'll have your ranunculus and anemones to yes. go with those tulips and daffodils next spring. And my stock, so, because I want to oh. want to grow stock successfully. Yes, <laughs> yes. it does great in a tunnel plant at early spring, that and Bells yeah. of Ireland. Um, yes. Okay. Um, one more real quick question, Daniel. Where can people find you on social media? What is what your your website and all that kind of stuff? What is it under? Yeah, um, Facebook or Petal Pickers Flower Co. On Instagram or Petal Pickers. And our website is petalpickers.com. And that is where we sell our weekly bouquets that you can um, send to a friend or family member anywhere across the country. We ship our flowers so you can find us there. Yeah, I did. I bought some of your flowers last year. I don't know if you remember. I sent it to my sister. Yeah, for your sister. With some butterfly ranunculus lasted her almost three weeks. She was mm. kept posting pictures and sending pictures every few days of them. So, mm -hmm. so Nicole. Where can we, where I can am, we yeah, on, uh, I have a active YouTube channel a few times a week. I have videos of just what's going on at the farm and that's Flower Hill Farm on the tube of you. And then on Facebook, it's Flower Hill Farm, New York. And the same thing with Instagram, Flower Hill Farm NY. And I have my website's flowerhillfarmny.com as well. So very good. Um, that's all the questions I had for you. So you're off the hook now for a while. But now we've got all the questions people have posted on Facebook, and there's a lot. Yeah, um, well, I want to ask just a couple questions yeah, that Dave didn't yeah. ask. I, I think people would be really interested to know, Nicole, who is your customer? Who are you selling to? What is your customer base, I guess? So my CSA is basically split in half between, I live in a town of 2,000 people, guys. 2,000 people. It's very small. Um, I have 18 members, which is exactly what I had last year, but... Um, Half of them are from my small town. And then we have a city of like 35,000 people about half hour away. So I do drive to that city and I make deliveries there. Um, and they are, I have some friends who are customers, but mostly they're people I've never met before who have just, um, you know, come across my, either my videos or a Facebook post or their friend of a friend of a friend. And I've actually, so I had a weekly gardening segment on the local television station um, and all that stuff. So, and newspaper articles and stuff like that. So just people just find out and they're like, wait a second, weekly bouquets. So um, that's where most of my customers come from. Yeah. That's who they are. And so you're selling directly to the retail, the end user. You're not selling to florist or I do sell. Yeah, I do. So being a town of 2000 people, um, we have a very small florist. I think I grow way too much for her, <laughs> but she's the type of florist and I adore them. I go hang out <laughs> at the um, their shop all the time. Um, they'll buy like five lilies, 20 gladiolas, and I'll drive it to them. I don't care. Like they're just so sweet to me. And um, so they're um, very small. So their orders are never more than a hundred dollars at a time, but so they're not my main customer. If I was just selling to them, I wouldn't be selling flowers. <laughs> right. Right. So Daniel, what is your customer base look like? We know that you ship across mm -hmm. the country, but, and now, especially now that things are kind of opening back up again, I think those of us that developed new markets like you did shipping. Now all your old customers are coming back. Are you in a pickle? Well, I think that's why we expanded this year because we, we planned that that would happen. So um, our store, everything's come back. And then South Carolina with COVID, 
you know, our business was open pretty, was open back up pretty quickly last year, but um, we're selling at our store. We have a flower bar set up seven days a week that people can come in and um, get our flowers off of the flower bar. We sell to event florist and we also sell to brick and mortar florist. Um, I just had a feeling this year that our fall season would be really strong with weddings coming back. And so we planted 10,000 dahlia tubers oh so God. that we, <laughs> we have enough. will be prepared for fall wedding season. And if I don't sell them all, I can dig them up. I can sell them. Um, that's another thing with some of these. I'll give you my address. Make, I must make <laughs> as much money selling the dahlia tubers as I do selling the flowers. Right. So um, we what just- What is your probably, predominant color? Um, white. Yeah. Yeah, but I peach, um, yeah. peach is number two, and then burgundy, and then blush. Money selling the dahlia tubers, mm. and do selling the flowers. So somebody's got some Facebook. Your dominant color. Um, white. <laughs> yeah. Dave, is that you? Uh, peach. Is Facebook on? Yeah, it's, it's, it's gone now. Okay. <laughs> I was trying uh, to read the comments. <laughs> the Ten thousand dahlias. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> So Daniel, let me just ask you, let's just go down a little rabbit hole right here. So do you get afraid being so vested in your business? I mean, I know that I used to not be afraid, but it's a little bolder sitting right here on your shoulders, you know? It is. What? Yeah. Um, this year, especially, <laughs> um, it's been go, go, go. It's, since March. Um, but the summer does slow down. So I'm trying to take breaks and regroup, but we have our dahlias in the ground. We, um, everything seems to be on track and we're getting ready to market for the fall. It's a lot, but that's why I think building a team is really the future of my business. Um, I have great people working for me, but I haven't found the standout that can run my business when I need to leave the farm yet. Yeah. The leader, mm -hmm. the leader. So Nicole, um, what do you see as your future? I mean, are you just, are you kind of happy doing what you're doing now, the level that you're at, or do you want to add, do you want to have a hundred CSAs? Or I would love that. <laughs> I would, I would love to have a hundred CSAs. Um, but I also think that I'm in a really, uh, I don't know, central location where I am. I have, I mean, honestly, I have New York city, just three and a half hours from me and I have Syracuse an hour and a half that way. And they have a huge regional market. I think that there is potential that I haven't tapped into yet yeah. when it comes to selling wholesale. Um, that might be <laughs> a little less, I don't know. Sometimes the CSA, I do, I made some mistakes with my CSA. Okay. So it's a lot more work than it needs to be right now for me. Um, Cause I allowed my members to skip weeks. So keeping track of who has how many left and when they're coming to pick them up because people are like, well, I can't come, but I can come Friday at three o'clock, you know, things like that. So it's a lot of um, juggling. So I think that there are a lot of untapped potential things that I can be doing, but I don't know if I'm happy. I, I want to grow more things always, <laughs> but I think if I am to do any more than I'm doing right now, I need to hire people for sure. <laughs> you know, it's so funny that you would say that about your CSA, because you know, when you're first coming into business and you're hungry, you know, you're pretty accommodating to people. But then what happens as your business starts to grow, you realize, I mean, if I say simplify, simplify, simplify anymore, people are going to really just turn me off um, because it's, there's so many moving pieces, right, Daniel? I mean, it's like, you can't, it's not that flower farming, like any business is so hard, nobody can do it. It's keeping all the pieces moving and mm -hmm. simplifying. You got to cut out these things that, I mean, I just so, 
you know how so often you look at another business and say, oh, I'm not sure why they don't do that, but we can do that. Well, it's yeah. like now we're not doing that either. <laughs> and I think I wasn't confident enough when I first started it to take on 18 members. So I was like, well, if I let them skip weeks, maybe I'll only have to fulfill 10 that week. So it was my way of building confidence and making sure I was going to have enough flowers for the first time I did a CSA. Now I'm on my third CSA and I'm like, okay, I think I might have to remove the ability to skip weeks <laughs> from now on because I could fit a whole nother CSA in that time. Right. So I'm, I'm losing out on, on more customers by allowing that. So, and you gotta have, you have to be smarter than that when you're formulating your business. Yeah. A good thing with CSAs is if people want to skip a week, you, they don't get to skip a week, but they can give it to somebody else. Right. They, uh, no, somebody they can else. Have, their friend can pick yeah. it up. They can give it yeah. to the neighbor, their mother, somebody else. Yeah, that's good advice. So I'll ask this question and then I'll ask both of you to answer it. So what would your advice be to new and upcoming growers? Um, what helped you or what just really brought you to where you are today or some of the things that have brought you? What would you tell them? Daniel, why don't you go first? Um, well, I'm a good example because I started with zero experience. So starting to grow flowers sounded like a crazy idea. Um, but what I would tell people, and I tell um, other flower growers around me all the time, is invest in yourself, um, whether that's online courses, whether that's joining the ASCFG, which is a national organization, um, with tons of information about growing cut flowers um, and spend the time to talk to other growers who are more experienced, um, reach out to them. But it's a huge learning curve. Um, and I'm in year five and I feel like I'm just still just trying to absorb. It makes more sense now <laughs> after going through it five times, but it's a lot of research and that's just online courses and getting help where you can find it. Don't, don't think you can just figure it out all on your own. You're going to waste so much time making the mistakes that all of us make. Um, but yeah, just learn from others. Nicole. I would say that you're going to fail at things and it's okay things are going to die and that's okay. <laughs> you just have to keep going. And people kind of make fun of me because I start so many seeds. Well, I do that because I know some of them aren't gonna make it into the ground because I'm only one person and I can only get so much into the ground at one time. So I always start twice as much as I'm gonna be needing because I anticipate either bug damage or sun scorch or something, but yeah, uh, things are not going to be uh, picture perfect all the time. And that's okay. You just have to keep going because otherwise nobody would be doing this because everyone has crop losses and, and weather damage and, uh, you know, family emergencies that make your peony field pop and you can't harvest it. So it's all, it's all a huge learning curve, like Daniel said, and you just kind of got to roll with the punches and, and do what you can. So um, I really appreciate the two of you guys joining us here this evening. And we do have some questions over on Facebook and I think there might even be some here on Zoom. Um, but I just wanted to say that we just appreciate you guys. We know it's in the growing season and I know better than anybody, just we're all tired. And I just appreciate you coming on here to share um, your experience and Dave and I as um, the instructor of the instructors of the courses that you guys took, it just really helps us to see the potential. When people do the work, you guys are both just great examples of what can happen. Okay. So I want to just take a moment and tell, because I've seen the question on here a couple of times, um, to let folks know, um, Dave, our registration does open next week, June 14th through the 18th of 2021. And um, if you're on our email list, you will know that we will not let you miss it. We'll send you <laughs> some emails to keep you on page. 
And we do have a really sweet deal this time when the bundle, if you haven't taken mine and Dave's course, um, we've sweetened the pot a little bit. And if you're on our email list, and I would recommend if you're not, go to our website, thegardenersworkshop.com and sign up for any list, whether it's on Dave's page, my page, or the homepage. An email goes out um, tomorrow that will have the deals um, the payment plans, if that's something that you need to have, um, because the courses go on sale on Monday. And we would just really love to have you join us because we have just seen, um, I don't, I haven't talked to Dave about this, but I have seen people make such giant steps in their business. Yes. Because they're, it's not, it's not like when you're a home gardener where you can like, okay, I'll figure this out slowly, but surely. When you start investing money, the point is to start reversing the money, the money to start coming back in as soon as possible. And um, we just really feel like we provide great information and we just would love to have more people come on the inside with us. And um, our courses are, um, all the details are on the gardenersworkshop.com. You can go to the online course page. There's one for mine, one for Dave's. My course will have a second registration in October, but because we wanted to offer this bundle of taking Dave's course and my course um, is why mine is available now. Dave's course starts the first week in July, right, Dave? That's July, when school begins. July 9th. Friday the 9th, it gets from the- in So the what that- so what that means, folks, is that you are in active school during the time that you're like ordering, selecting which bulbs, which perennials, how are you going to grow it? I mean, um, even though you get continued support after school is over through our alumni Facebook groups, um, to be able to have access directly to Dave every week on your live Q&A is, is pretty amazing. Um, I really feel like that's just a really significant part of our course and the support that goes on. So check it out on thegardenersworkshop.com. Get on our email list so you'll get the emails with the special links. If you are a, if you own any online course with the Gardeners Workshop, on demand or a school, that means you're a member of the Gardeners Workshop family. And anybody that's a member of our family always gets $50 off of any school course. Um, but we've even sweetened that deal even more for people buying the bundle. So um, I feel like the cut flower industry, the, what we've experienced the last 16 months just seems like it's just gonna, the momentum is keeping it up with the breakdown of the um, shipping lanes and the international world. I mean, it's an opportunity more now than ever before for growers, wouldn't you say, Dave? Yeah, it's just the international floral chain has broken right now and local flowers can be the answer to that. Um, There's just the demand and the need for the locally grown flowers. And it's not just the shipping chain, it's the result of the pandemic. Farms didn't invest, they don't oh, yeah. have workers. They, I mean, so this is a long-term view. So now is just a great time to jump in and get there and to do it as quickly as you can. So Dave, have you been scouring the questions over I've here? Look at some, one is real quick, Nicole, can you explain your flower bar, how that works? So I have buckets of blooms and uh, they're priced by the stem. So say, you know, a tulip would be one price and then I would have a filler that would be another price. And I have a chalkboard and I have all the prices of the stems and people just come up to the bar and they explore and make their own bouquets. Um, I've had some people uncomfortable making their own bouquets and they ask me to do it for them. And I'm more than happy <laughs> to mm -hmm. just run around on the porch and make a bouquet for them. And, you know, I'll ask them questions and, you know, what's your favorite color or is this a gift? And you want to make it extra special. And that way you add a few more stems in there, um, stuff like that. But, um, the pricing basically, um, everyone asks me how I price my stems and I kind of just go to the Boston USDA ornamental price list. And I make sure it's a lot more than that right. <laughs> for Cause I'm still, it's retail yeah. when you're selling at the bouquet bar, not a lot more than that, but a lot more than that. Um, I'm in a very, very rural area. I'm not in a huge city, so I'm not selling $8 stems of flowers, but they're definitely above wholesale prices when I'm selling them off my porch. 
um, I think that's only fair to my florist as well. I don't want to um, hurt her business like that. So, um, but everything's different. Like I just, the specialty tulips are going to be different than my Lysianthus and stuff. So you kind of just have to do your research about what stuff is selling for, especially retail. Um, I've friends of mine will even call the florist and say, what, what is one stem of a sunflower going for or a rose? And that way you get kind of an equivalent price of what you should be selling your stuff for. Right. Very good. Um, Katie's asking if you need to be on Facebook to participate in the online classes that Gardener Workshop does. You uh -oh. don't need to be on it. The only thing is there is a closed Facebook group that's with your other students. And so if you're not on Facebook, you wouldn't have that. The weekly Q&A is done on Zoom. Um, but in case you didn't know, you can join Facebook and your relatives, your neighbors, your friends don't, have, don't need to know you're on there. Just keep your profile private and you still join in and be part of the Facebook group for the students. And the support that in the alumni groups, it doesn't end when the course ends. Right. You know, you can ask Dave a question 10 years from now and he's going to answer you. <laughs> and you know, that is just something we are really building momentum on. Um, I'm now jumping into my alumni group and doing lives out in the garden, like we harvested sunflowers together mm -hmm. last week. So that's really awesome. So, um, Somebody, Katie is asking, any tips for narrowing down the crops when you just want to grow everything? And I think that that's something that I probably push a little too hard in my course about people streamlining. In the beginning, you just, I mean, it, don't you think it just makes it so much more overwhelming to grow 25 yeah. oh, different yes. things? stick with 10 or 15 and do it well and grow more of them. It makes it easier to make bouquets. It makes it easier to manage them, makes it easier to live life, right? Right. I think I have 30 or 40 perennials in my class and I would never expect someone to grow all of them. Pick 10 or 12 and start with those. And you do those well, then add a few more every year. Don't try and plant them all at once. Same with annuals. There's a hundred yes. different annuals you can grow. Don't do them all the first year. Or you'll burn yourself out. Just. I think we do years. all. We plant them all the first couple of years, though. I don't think anybody can help themselves. Um, That's but why this, we're flower farmers, right? Exactly. I mean, I've planted everything. And last year, I just had enough because you do start to realize that you're not growing everything high quality. You're, a lot of stuff is not that great when you're growing too many things. Right. And so we've started to cut out, we have have started to cut a lot of the smaller things from production. So that's like, we chose dahlias as our main thing this fall, and we'll have a little bit of some other things. But I used to try to grow amaranth, gumfrina, celosia, a last round of zinnias when I have dahlias blooming. And it just, we've cut a lot of that out, you know. And that comes already, with yeah. experience and wisdom, right? Experience, yeah, and frustration. <laughs> frustration, yeah. I've already cut things out for next year. <laughs> Right. And that happens. I were, you know, looking back over 20 some years of growing, I did like y'all are talking about growing everything. And then we hit hyper. Oh. Is it just Lisa? I uh, yes, yeah. just Lisa. Her power might have gone off. She was having a storm come. Oh well. Um, <laughs> I'll go to the questions. <laughs> um, she might be back. I know the ones before that happened, and she came back in a few minutes when the power came back. Um Someone asked if the my class covers growing ranunculus and crates. It does talk about growing items and crates and ranunculus. It does discuss it. Yes. Um, somebody wants to know how do you get longer stems in your hydrangeas? She has a short stem with a woody trunk. That's because it's the macrophyllas that will always have a shorter stem like that. If you're really careful, you can prune them so you only get fewer stems per trunk, so to speak. Um, but if you grow the limelights, those get really long stems without any problem. And let me go and read the questions on Facebook. There's a whole That's bunch what I'm planting here. this year is the limelights. Yeah, you're going to love the limelights. Um, I'm excited. And just remember in the class how I told you to prune them. So I just rewatched it. I just <laughs> okay. rewatched it at 7 p.m. I go. remember everything. Because um, if you just got new plants planting this year, you'll still harvest off of them the first year for limelight. That's a great thing. Hey, uh, yeah, I got the quick turn size. Um, oh. You think four feet on those four foot spacing? Uh, four foot spacing, yeah. Okay. Yep, they'll be good. Um, somebody's asking where's the best place to buy a greenhouse or a tunnel? Somewhere close to you because shipping is usually expensive. In the Northeast, there's a place called Ledgewood Farms that I had a couple of his tunnels. It's basically a farmer that started making tunnels and 
they're really sturdy. I had them in a two and a half foot blizzard of snow and never touched them and they did not wow. collapse. The snow fell right off of them. So they're very winter hardy, so to speak. Um, but it needs to be um, like if you're in Oklahoma or you're in Oregon, you wouldn't buy from him because the shipping would be a lot. Just look for a place that's near you um, and make sure that it's good enough for your weather, whether you're you know, the windy south or the snow, deep snow in the north. Um, let's see. Now, Kristen says she wants a shirt too, I guess, when you make them. Maybe you can sell them. Do you have stuff on your website? You can sell I, am, I am making a shirt, yes. <laughs> okay. Lisa's back. Woo. Yes, Lisa, your power go out? Yes, it just That's flickered figured. for a minute. And now, yes, yeah, so now we're back. Holy we're, we're, You're back. Technology is why I'm great, <laughs> y'all. And it's still on I Facebook. That was good. the button on my freezer, <laughs> though. It's screaming. Okay. Uh -oh. um, I was, Kelly's asking, what is, the bake, what is the bed maker and what brand? The bed maker is the thing that goes behind your tractor that Usually you've already pre-tilled the soil and made it soft, so it's uh, movable, so to speak. And it forms the soil to make the raised bed and can also put uh, plastic on the top at the same time, whether you're using plastic film or the film that Lisa uses, the Biotella, that uh, disintegrates after the year. Um, but you need to have a tractor big enough to pull it. That's the trick. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember what, Lisa, what brand is your bed maker? Because I, I ended up getting a different brand. Yeah, um, mine is Rainflow. There Rainflow. is Amish made in Pennsylvania. And my model is the Mini 2400. Best, I mean, I guess I would say my John Deere was the best purchase. I made change. Well, it quadrupled our business the first year yeah. I had it right. because we could grow more. But that bed layer, oh my gosh. I have the exact same bed layer because of you, Lisa. So I never had to lay anything down by hand. I've always used the bed maker since the first season. You just yeah. haven't lived yet, Daniel. I guess not. <laughs> I, I mean, I just um, follow everything you say and it works out pretty good. Yep. So I wanted to get the same bed layer. And um, if you go to buy a tractor right now, unless it's on the lot, it's a six month wait because right. of everything so backed up. So I ended up only able to purchase a 35 horse tractor. Wait, it might be 37. I can't remember, but, um, cause doesn't the one rainflow require 40? Yes. Yeah. So we were not able to get a 40 horsepower tractor. So my bed layer is a Nolts and that yes. only required a 30 or a 32 horse. So, um, that I was, um, very happy to find that. So, yeah. And you know, it's just, I now, we have two tractors. One was, is an older one. Um, I now totally understand why farmers want like four tractors so they can have an yeah. implement on each one. So you don't have to, you don't have to change, change it. it. Yeah. But you know what? I mean, I using a tractor for bed laying opened such a world to me that I can put my bed layer on by myself. I can put the tiller on by myself. Um, I mean, it is, it's so worth it to us. Um, anyway, so glad I got to come back on here. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Are you looking at questions, I'm Dave? At questions. I have one here from Katie. He's asking, how do you advise for beginners to foster a community and collaboration with other competitors in the local market? Um, tough question. Um, if you're selling with them at a farmer's market, visit with them, talk with them. Um, you know, there's other, if you have a state or local cut flower association, I know in Maryland where I was at, there's an informal group that meets three times over the winter. Um, there's other co-op groups in different parts of the country. Um, find one, and if there isn't one, start one. Um, I know in Pennsylvania they did that. It was a group, of, it was a Facebook group of Pennsylvania flower growers and they had a whole one day meeting at the state, at the state capitol. They used the Department of Agriculture's office building, their conference room, and just got together for the day to meet and greet and talk with each other. So. Just start your own and invite everybody you know. Um, competition's fine. Um, that makes everything better. You can make yes. you grow better flowers and do a better job of it. So don't fear competition um, unless they're undercutting you and have poor crop yeah. product, but then you'll outshine and do better than, better than they will. We have a great group here in South Carolina and it's informal, but it's like 30 growers. All We're all located within a short driving distance from each other. SC Upstate Flowers, and we put out a price list together each week to the local florist. Um, and we have group text message. We meet about every other month um, at each other's farms. 
And we are always asking each other whenever we have a new crop come on what we should be charging. We kind of pass it by everyone and it helps us get the highest price across the board on all of our crops. Very yeah. smart. Yeah. So and you're sending out this list of all the florists and the florist buys from each farm individually. Yeah, we don't have a cooperative set up yet, but we're still kind of presenting ourselves as your upstate South Carolina flower farmers as a group. So somewhat Lisa just mentioned over here on Facebook that Ellen Frost course is really good too. The flower shortage explanation is incredible. Great information. I think, um, you know, I think Ellen Frost, Ellen, for anyone that doesn't know her, Ellen Frost is a florist that owns a design studio in Baltimore, Maryland that only uses flowers grown within 100 miles of her shop. She is like a flower farmer's dream come true. Mm -hmm. I mean, we want Ellen Frost to be teaching the entire world why they should not be shipping flowers in. Anyway, Ellen has a course and she takes you through the history of flowers, the American florist. The, it's just so incredible. So Lisa, thank you so much for mentioning that. We just did a special run of her course because of this incredible shortage that many flower shops are actually um, facing. So I really appreciate you um, mentioning that. And a lot of folks on here are talking about <laughs> taking the courses. Um, and so I just want to say that I'm trying to drop a hint here, y'all. <laughs> if you even buy one of our on-demand $20 classes, that makes you a member of my family. <laughs> and when you're a member of my family, you always get A, $50 off of a school, but we've even sweetened it more this time. So you want to do that before next week's eat mails start coming with the special deal because our students for the bundle are saving almost $200. Um, and I can tell you from a business perspective that it will be the best investment you'll make in your business because you get the two of us. I think I wrote it in an email day today, forever. <laughs> You're forever in our group. You know, I mean, it's, it's, isn't it true, Dave? It's like yeah. until we croak, right. um, <laughs> because even when we can't farm anymore, we're still loving doing this part. Right. Um, so what else anybody got to say? I'm looking I, I got two questions both of you. Somebody asked, what's your water source? Did you have to drill a new well, anybody? Or is it just the well that was on the farm to begin with? We had to drill I, a new well. Yeah. Mine, the farm I had, had a well that was only 45 feet deep and it ran forever and I never had a problem. So I guess I was lucky. Ours is <laughs> 140. So I still consider that lucky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I probably need a new one drilled, but um, <laughs> it ran dry four or five times last year, but we were also, we're still in a drought. It's been over a year that we were considered in a drought. Um, so I'm hoping that once our weather regulates, is that a thing? Does that not happen? No, don't <laughs> no, even count on it. Ever. No, we, can't, we can't count on it. So I do have rain collection um, that I, I have two 300 gallon tanks that I have set up with my gutter system. Right, very good. And we do get rain. So I, and then we, we got the forks for the tractor and we move it around to the crops. And I have a strong way, massively strong sprinkler system that <laughs> that's what I have to do right now. Cause I have flowers half mile down there. You know, they're right. not something that I can reasonably run drip to. We have a wildflower field that I'm watering right now with the sprinkler system. So yeah, rainwater is, is help helping me for sure. So somebody's asking, so what time is Lisa's class if Dave's class starts in July? So my course runs in November into the middle of December. Um, and you can register now or you can register in October, but the bundle special deal that we're offering is only good for this registration. Um, so, and then the other one is, do you cover very basics helping set up a grow room and how to set up a germination fully in 72? Yes. So my course, and 
what, what you're going to find if they're not already there, it'll happen next week when the courses go on sale is our syllabuses will be there. And that's basically just the outline of the course, like a chapters of a book. And you can go in and look. Dave's course has over 70. I didn't count the minor bulbs, Dave, and you because you kind of lumped them together. But I went through and counted and there's 70 bulbs, perennials and shrubs um, that are in your list individually. Um, so my course takes you through the ucky part of setting up your business, which nobody wants to do. And once you do it, you're liberated, it's done, you're legal, you don't have to worry about it anymore, and you can just move on with your life. Then we build a garden, then you learn how to sell and who to sell to and starting seeds and growing annuals and making some bucks. And then you're in that same time, you're already, you know, ordering perennials and planting them and um, getting your ball rolling, you know? Um, so got any other questions there, Dave? Well, here's one of somebody asking us, the course is only live. They're not live. Oh. They're put in your library every Friday morning and you've got forever to watch them and you just watch them when you have time to watch it. The only thing that's live is during that six weeks is every week, well, for me, it's on Thursday evening, a live Q and A on Zoom. That's the only thing that's truly really live. Other than that, it's always recorded. You can watch it anytime you want and watch it over and over if you need to. And um, also, it's not on Facebook yet, but Tuesday, which I believe is the 15th, I'm going to be doing a Facebook Live taking you inside Dave's course to look at one of the sessions. And you'll kind of, I understand for people that have never taken an online course, it's like, how in the world does this work? It's basically videos. And it's videos of whether it's watching somebody or looking at slides and listening to them talk about it. Um, I'm gonna take you inside the course on Tuesday evening so you can kind of see how you log in and what you're gonna see. And you own that for life. Just like buying a book y'all, but instead of picking up the book, you pick up a device that has internet and you log into your library and in your library are all the courses you've ever bought from us. And you can watch them over and over as many times as you'd like and you have it forever. And when we add stuff, when we add another bonus session, even though you took the course two years ago, guess what? It shows up in your course. So your course gets richer and richer with each passing year in addition the Q and A's are recorded. And so those get added in to your course. So your course gets bigger and bigger. My course, I think, is this the third or the fourth year? I can't even remember. Fourth. My course is a monster. I mean, it's like, there's so many bonuses and so many Q and A's. Um, we are, anyway, I won't even say what we're trying to figure out how to do, because if we can't do it, I don't want you to be looking for it. But it just really gets, I mean, there's just a lot of information and you have access to, you own it. It's yours forever. Um, any other questions, Dave? Well, somebody had a question asking what peonies do they suggest? And they listed like six or seven varieties here and not a single one on there would I recommend that you start out with because they're the more expensive, more unique varieties. Stick to the bread and butter, Sarah Bernhardt, Masur Jules Ali, Coral Charm, Red Charm, Kansas. You buy, plant those five you're set. You don't have to ever plant anything other varieties. You want to have more of them, um, but you don't have to buy the fancy, more expensive ones because your customer buying a pink peony just wants a pink peony. They don't care if it's Sarah Bernhardt or Pink Hawaiian Charm. It's a pink peony to them. Um, once you get into more upscale designers, they might care about the real fancy varieties, but for the most part, you're going to make just as much money growing the, the basic. And Dave, don't you think that that is perhaps one of the most important aspects of our courses. It's not just telling you what you should do. It's telling you what you shouldn't do and waste time on and wasting money on, oh my gosh, every day on social media, I have to like, there's just not enough time in the day. I wanna say to people, why are you wasting your time doing that? I mean, that's just not affecting your bottom line and buying these expensive varieties I mean, I know it's if it's special to you, then you need to be a great avid gardener and love it. But you're commercially, that is not right. good business. There are peonies that cost fifteen, hundred dollars each, and people buy them, and I just cringe 
It's fine if you're buying it for plant for your garden, right. love and enjoy, but not to try and make money. So I, I remember I emailed you once, Dave, asking yeah. if it was a typo in the price <laughs> right. list, for one of the panties. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's one that has called Lois something and a customer called and wanted to buy it for his, because it's his wife's name. He didn't realize the price. And then when I told him the price, he said, no, thanks. But I guess he didn't like, <laughs> he didn't like his wife that much. It was $250. <laughs> It's just a really new variety. It's, it's really pretty and it's special, but you're never gonna make money selling it as a cut flower, that's all. <laughs> so that's one thing about your course, Dave, that really helped me was it's not just telling you how to grow these perennials in bulbs, but you really go from A to Z. And with your, you know, you've been a successful cut flower grower, so you truly know how to grow all these crops, but you're also, um, from the sales point of view, you see what everyone across the country is ordering. Right. And so you know, like which varieties are the best ones to plant and you know, um, who's buying certain crops in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you throw that information into the course. I know you will explain like, well, if you're up North, you might want to do it this way. If you're a little warmer, you may want to do it this way. And I think that's so important because, you know, say ranunculus, for example, I start planting ranunculus in October and Nicole, you can't do that. You know, no. that's anyways, I just appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. How in depth, you know, you went and then you don't just tell us like, Oh, this is how you plant and grow and harvest a tulip. You say, hey, if you're going to grow a lot of tulips, you better build a walk-in cooler so that you have a place to store them. And yeah. this is how you store them that, so that you can have them for four weeks so that you're able to sell the same crop <laughs> to all the way through. And so, you know, this year we built two new walk-in coolers wow. and just because we were going to grow 18,000 tulips. And that's because you told us to. <laughs> so, I didn't say 18,000, but okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, you know, you say in that, Daniel, you know, the other thing, if anybody hasn't ever experienced any of Dave's teaching or been to a conference where he's teaching, <laughs> Dave is a fast talker. There is nobody that can pack in as much. I mean, I can pack in a lot of information in a short period of time, but he warps me. <laughs> and here is a gift that I'm gonna tell people, if you're using the phone app for our online courses or either on the computer, it's there too, I'm sure. You just go to your settings. You can literally slow Dave down. <laughs> so you can take in more of his class. And I mean, I speed, I speed listen to a lot of my online courses that I take because people talk too slow. You know, it's like, I, you can listen to them at two times and still understand everything they're saying. Not so with Dave Dowling. You have to slow him down to like 0.75. That's just a tip. That's true. It's true. I know. <laughs> but we love you for it. I want that is it. part of the magnificentness of, to me of our courses is that there's just so much information packed in. You have to go back and watch it over and over and over. And don't you find, I mean, like Nicole, with you as you're just, each year you're passing, your business changes. And it's like, you know what? Now I'm going to go back and figure out how to do X, Y, Z that he was talking about that I might not have paid much attention to my first year, right? Oh, I am I am very excited to dive into his greenhouse section and like high tunnel section yes. because that, that's happening for me. Hasn't happened yet, but I know when it happens where I'm going to be going. <laughs> yeah, and it's just great to have that. And somebody just posted... Do the courses offer a list of wholesale commercial suppliers as a reference? Yes, that's part of the gift is mm -hmm. that there are um, links and reference sheets of where to buy every and anything. And if there's, and here's the other thing, y'all, if there is anything you have a question about or a challenge or a problem or something you can't find, that's when you either ask it on the live Q&A or you ask it in the Facebook group and you get the information. Um, we want to give you everything you need. We're not trying to hold. There's there is nothing held back. That's probably to our fault, right, Dave? But yes. we tell it all, unfortunately. <laughs> um, two other questions here. Someone says, "Is it limited enrollment numbers? Um, how many people will be in the class with you? You won't know how many people in the class other than in the Facebook group. Uh, watching the class itself is just you and the screen. 
So it, right. if there's 30 people or 3,000, which it would never be 3,000, um, but it doesn't matter. Um, the class, you'll still get the same out of the class. Um, yes. And here's the next question somebody has, they only have one acre and thinking of starting. Um, would three beds, 90 feet long, four feet wide be enough? Would be too much. Well, my first comment is four feet wide, stick with three feet wide. It's easy to reach the middle. Four feet wide yes. is just too wide for almost everything. Um, three beds, 90 feet long, it might seem like a lot to you, but that's not much. You're gonna fill that up really fast with your succession planning of sunflowers and celosias, things like that. So you can start with that for the very first planting, but then you're gonna add probably three or four times that later and maybe have up to nine or 10 beds, 90 feet long. So I'm just reading a question over here. What is the app that coincides with the course and where to go on Lisa's site to sign up for the class, even the small classes? So the app that you would put on your phone for our courses is Kajabi. That's K-A-J-E-B-I. -I. I think now that I'm thinking, I'm tired. Oh, no. um, Kajabi is the app. And if you go to the gardenersworkshop.com and on their online courses are right there on the homepage, go there. The first top few are our big courses, our big schools, but below that are some on-demand courses, which you can buy anytime and watch anytime, which includes um, some really great ones. Jenny Love has one and Jonathan and Megan Lease, and then there's some shorter um, others, but you can find all that at the gardenersworkshop.com. And let's um, wrap this up. I don't know if um, we all have, um, I watch Daniels, I'm just reading. Everybody loves your stories, Daniel. Everybody loves your YouTube and think that your, your maroon hoodie is just the bomb. Thank you. Can't. Listen, yeah. I keep looking up because there's a hummingbird stuck in my porch. <laughs> Oh, oh really? He loves me and he just keeps going up and up and up. he can't get out. So I'm going to have to take him, get a net and, and save him when I'm done with this. Well, you know, I wonder if you turn the lights off, if he wouldn't just fly away. That's what we do for bees and birds. Yeah. Um, so somebody's asking, does the courses cover what works for all growing zones? And I'll tell you, Jenny, what I tend to tell people is Dave and I really make a big point of not only offering information at, as we answer it for whatever your area is, we try to give you the tools that apply to growing stuff to figure out for your own growing area. Yeah. But in my class, yeah. for all the perennials and woodies, I did it in every crop. I said what the zones were. So yes. you know right away if you can or can't grow it. And Molly's asking, Molly, about the um, bundle, the special is their code. It will, it's not a special hidden bundle. Um, once the courses go live, when you go to the pages, they'll be right there, but it will also be in an email that's being sent out tomorrow just for you to see all the details. So be sure you get on our email list, um, but it will be posted right on the course sales pages. Um, now the student discount you will actually be emailed those special prices. Those aren't on the website for just anybody to purchase. Only students will have access to that. So I just thank you guys. I thank you, Nicole and Daniel for sharing how you. your businesses have just, you know, they're up and coming and going and it's just very inspiring for us and for everybody listening. Um, and we really appreciate your time. And I know that you're both, Hooped, maybe Daniel more than the rest of us because he's in the South. So he's doing more. And um, Dave, thank you so much for coming on here. And you can, Dave and I will be all over the place next week. We'll be on Clubhouse. We'll be on Instagram. We'll be on Facebook. We'll, um, we'll be getting around. So you guys get on our email newsletter list. We kind of share all that information and um, we'll just try to keep you abreast. And thank you guys so much all of you that joined us here um, and I appreciate it so much. Thanks, so, thank you. Thank good you to so talk much. With good to see you guys. Have a good one, everybody. Bye. Ciao. Good night, everybody.